I think we are live now. Let's wait for some more time. So we are live now. Hello, good evening, everyone. We'll start in a couple of seconds. Okay. Okay, so let's do a quick uh, sound check. You're able to hear me, Manju and Ravi, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So good evening, everyone. This is OT Security Huddle 13. And today we are going to talk about an uh, incident which has happened. And we have a special guest invited today, Ravi. He will be actually taking us through the journey of that entire incident response and the activities that has been done during this particular incident. So uh, joining me is... Uh, my co-host Manju and the guest Ravi, uh, myself Shiv, and we have been doing this OT security huddle sessions since last year. We bring a specialized topic focused on the different issues in uh, operational technology security, as well as sometimes on the other topics of cybersecurity like forensics and the career orientation. So if you are new and joining it for the first time, you can check out the previous episodes on our YouTube channel and also on LinkedIn Live. We have a dedicated page available on LinkedIn where we also share some resources and also provide uh, free mentorship. So OT Security Huddle is an outcome of our personal interest. It has nothing to do with the organization we have been associated with. And uh, whatever we are discussing here is our personal opinion. This does not have to be construed necessarily the opinion of the organization we are associated with. Having said that, uh, I welcome Ravi and Manju, both of you. Thanks for taking time today and also uh, jotting down the points for discussion and actually the preparation of this special topic. This is, I'm sure, uh, going to be a very good involving discussion today. But before that, uh, Ravi, you are joining this platform for the first time. So let me take a pause and then introduce you to the uh, audiences online. So Ravi, uh, Bhutavade is an OT security architect with Tetra Pak now. He is an IT uh, professional with more than 15 years of experience in cybersecurity. Last five years, he's been working on the OT security topic in various domains, start, uh, ranging from pharmaceutical to automobile to uh, different consulting companies. He have experience in cyber forensic security operations, endpoint security and all. On certification side, he is also IEC 62443 uh, cybersecurity expert. He also CISSP, which is quite amazing. And he holds uh, other management certifications like CISM, ISO uh, 27001, and the uh, automobile sector specific certification like ISO 21434. On the community service side, he is an active member of different forums like uh, uh, ISC2, ISACA, ISA, Bangalore section, and since ICS community. He's also a participating member in ICS for ICS, which is a global community designing the uh, incident response for industrial control system. And again, he is also an active contributor on LinkedIn community. So welcome, Ravi. Welcome, Manju. Uh, before I hand it over to you, how are you feeling today? Thanks you and Manju for this uh, warm welcome. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to share my experience from my past. Thanks, Ravi. So Manju, how was your energy today? Yeah, how is the Josh? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so because anyways, we are talking about uh, ransomware today. And uh, so the Josh should be very high. Uh, so you need to protect <laughs> your system from these such. You know, nowadays we are hearing a lot about uh, ransomware attacks. 
and we got to learn a lot of things from uh, the experience uh, from Ravindra. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Ravindra, for accepting our invitation and to be a part of this uh, huddle. So hope to you know uh, learn a lot from you uh, in this session. Thanks you for arranging this in a quick time. No, thanks to both of you for jotting down the points and then. Uh, taking time from your personal life for discussing this topic with the community. I am sure this is going to help the community a lot. So having said that, uh, today we are going to discuss a little bit about incident response life cycle. And then we immediately start after that the deep dive of this uh, one particular ransomware incident. And then we'll try to map the different phases of incident response with the actual incident that has happened and the activity that has been done over there. So let me start with the incident uh, response life cycle. There are different models available. If you go to the NIST website, there are four different phases and then they are sub phases. And if you go to other websites, there you might find seven different phases. But overall, the gist is like first you need to prepare about incident response. You will gather the information about how you will be able to identify an incident if it, how it happens. You train the people, you gather the tools and all those things. Then when an, actually an incident happens, you use these learnings, the trainings, the tools, your network infrastructure, your teams to actually identify the incident. And once you've identified, of course, you need to mitigate that. And in other words, you need to eradicate that. Uh, post eradication or mitigation, the next step is, of, of course, you want to know what has actually gone wrong in your understanding of incident management. You do an investigation. It also involves forensic analysis. And finally, when you have done this all, you would like to know what was the missing gaps and missing points that were there in your incident response plan. You do a lessons learned and include this in your preparation stage again. So that's how the life cycle is. And these are the five phases we are going to discuss today. So yeah, uh, these are the five phases. I think uh, we have already done a dedicated session on the incident response earlier. And today's discussion more towards is the practical aspect of it, which is there. So, um, Ravi, uh, how would you like to start? What is your experience there? And what kind of incident it was when you were actually have uh, been working with the previous organization? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, I, I would like to tell this in kind of, an, uh, kind of a short story because I believe we human beings are good in storytelling and these stories remain into our memories for a longer time. So just just uh, before jumping into that, uh, let me take you back three years back. Uh, this was the COVID time. We all know across the globe uh, how the situation was. And uh, most of the pharmaceutical firms across the globe have been working on to develop these vaccines. I believe that was also the time threat actors uh, realized that, yes, that's the core value or the core sector that can be targeted because, yes, we all know if, if some kind of a ransomware things happens on two such organizations, they are likely, likely to pay that ransom. So if you see, uh, uh, we can see on the left hand side, Dr. Reddy, uh, uh, I've just highlighted a few dates here. So Dr. Reddy got hit uh, by a ransomware attack. It was in 2020. Uh, Is he frozen? Manju, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I think Ravi was frozen. Maybe some kind of internet issue. Yeah. OK, so he was actually giving this uh, timeline of the attack, which was three years ago in 2020. And I think he wanted to relate, relate this with a uh, uh, news which was also available on two different websites you can go and then check about these organizations and as we all know that the Indian pharmaceuticals were quite busy in those days uh, developing the vaccines and uh, the whole world were, uh, on one side was looking towards India that what is the progress that is happening and on the other side the adversaries were trying to disrupt and then get into these systems also so that was the story that uh, uh, happened three years ago Maybe I'll just quickly check with him what is the issue. Okay, Manju, you are checking already. Sorry for this network glitch. You know, this uh, live sessions, we typically try to avoid this with different uh, redundant connections, but yeah. Yes, uh, so uh, often, 
I mean, I would like to share a few stuff uh, on the ransomware attack. Uh, we usually, you know, we often hear from industry folks that uh, in many industry experts uh, tell that, okay, uh, this is more concerned with the, you know, the enterprise level, uh, that is level, uh, you know, more than it's IT enterprise level, but not with respect to OT. So why, uh, you know, one should think in the OT security domain, uh, you know, uh, since it is mainly uh, with the corporate, uh, then uh, the OT security folks no need to bother. Uh, I mean, this is some kind of, uh, you know, argument that I often hear. So maybe uh, I would see yeah, yeah. the point of view in this regard. Yeah, so uh, basically you are bringing the point that whose responsibility it is it, whether it should be the IT team or the OT team looking for the ransomware. But I think it's uh, the human thing that they are focused, they should be focused on the, the security aspect they are handling. So it ultimately takes one incident or one issue that can impact the entire uh, organization. It could be from your IT side or OT sides. If you take examples of, uh, let's say, Stuxnet, there is high possibility that from the uh, OT side, this kind of attack were perpetrated. And there is a possibility, uh, very high possibility that uh, uh, OT systems, which is getting a remote connectivity directly to a, a maintenance engineer, and then the ransomware gets in from outside. So there could be n number of combination, but yeah, we'll, we'll park this discussion to the end of this uh, session today. Ravi is back here. Uh, Ravi, how is your connection holding up now? Oh, yeah. I think he's frozen again. Yeah, I think so. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds. Okay, so while he joins, uh... Let's move a little bit ahead. So this was the news that was there about the specific attack. And when Ravi joins, we'll continue from there. But yeah, we have this slide deck, so we can definitely go ahead and then start discussing. Okay, just in time, he has joined back. Ravi, uh, are, you, are you connected now? Can you hear me, Ravi? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Do okay. I am audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible now. Sorry for that glitch, guys. Uh, no, no issues. We, we are just talking about the news and then just move to the slide. Do you want to take a, a moment back to this uh, news? Yeah, yeah. I will just just take it across. Uh, yeah. So sorry for that. Uh, going to the right hand side, this was the company that I was been working on, uh, which got hit by a ransomware attack. So if you see the timelines, uh, it is just one week after after that. And uh, just to give a background of what this organization is all about. Uh, around 20,000 odd users, uh, 15 plus manufacturing plants across India and in global presence. One of the top five uh, pharmaceutical firms in India. So that is the kind of a background uh, of the company that I was been working. And just one week later, we also got hit uh, by this ransomware attack. Though it has been into news for just just kind of a uh, single day, it was into news. But let's let's go through the next slide to understand what was the exact impact and the forensic analysis that happened. Yeah. So now let's uh, go and jump into those timelines that I have just reflected here. 22nd October was the day when Dr. Reddy, uh, uh, he, uh, we can say ransomware incident, got into limelight. And just a week later, uh, I still remember that day, uh, still uh, very, very, uh, we can say live into my memories, I can say. It was an early Friday morning, 30th of October. And uh, I just got a call around 3.30 uh, in the morning. So as as I was the person who uh, or looking the SOC operations also into my earlier organization, I was been uh, called up by the local IT manager. But as usual, we IT guys, uh, in the first call, I, I, I did not pick up that call as I was in a sleep. But maybe another within another 10, 15 minutes, I got the second call. And then I realized, yes, something would have gone wrong. 
and then uh, i picked up the call and he just asked me that uh, yeah there is there's an emergency and you just need to jump into a call there was nothing that has been known so just imagine uh, on the 30th of october early morning around 3:40 3:30 uh, that was the time when we jumped into that call it was around 50 odd members it members across the we can say uh, across india that were been there into that call right from your uh, technical guys to the management teams and all and we were just trying to identify what exactly has happened no one was knowing at that time because uh, the technical teams were trying to identify the ads uh, the ad servers were having few issues no uh, authentication authorization was just happening on the servers so everyone was just trying to identify what exactly is the root cause so if you move next to the timeline uh, uh, we can say uh, around uh, yeah so around uh, 4:30 around uh, uh, we got news from one of our uh, global location which was maxico uh, that was the first global location to report back to us that yes they have started seeing those ransomware messages onto their screens and that was the legacy systems i can i can clearly say that uh, because it was still running on windows 7 uh, we will be talking about those into my next slide but yes that was the first systems that got impacted and it was been confirmed now that it was a ransomware attack and uh, if if you if you if you see uh, uh, how we are able to identify that uh, the global location uh, communicated back uh, it was luckily that we had an incident response team third party incident response team uh, which we had just onboarded one month back uh, before this incident happened and i believe people here who would be uh, talking to their procurement teams it's not easy to take a new, uh, new team or a new organization into your uh, we can say organization uh, or a new vendor because there is there's a lot of process that happens when a new vendor needs to be onboarded so after a lot of tussles uh, from the procurement team asking that is it really required uh, ransomware kind of an uh, incidents are this kind of an real so that was the kind of a discussion with the procurement team but yeah it was lucky enough that we had that third party incident response team and we got that team uh, and around 4:30 around uh, we took an uh, remote session of that global uh, location and we were able to identify that exact script so we got that third party the third party run those tool uh, they took and dump of that system specifically uh, uh, we can say talking about the various processes that were been running and uh, if you see the next timeline within uh, within 5:30 uh, they were able to identify that exact script so till that time uh, if you see the impact the impact was spread across our manufacturing plants we all know uh, within pharmaceutical firms or any manufacturing firms 24 by 7 is the kind of and things the operations work in the back end so at that time uh, though the it people or we can say the it folks uh, or mostly the normal people we can say the employees uh, though it was an early morning that impact was not there but i can i can clearly say across all those plants uh, we had an impact across the 15 plus manufacturing plants where most of the system started seeing that particular ransomware message Uh, if you go next to the timeline uh, as i said uh, around 6 am we were able to that third party was able to identify that script uh, though it was kind of an uh, one to two hours kind of an time time gap but till that time the impact was already seen across those manufacturing plants though the impact on the employee side uh, because as it was very early morning uh, employees within india across the globe it was very early morning so no laptops were been uh, on uh, except the ones that we were working Uh, but yeah uh, earlier uh, most of this manufacturing plants and the legacy os was the first which got impacted and uh, the last timeline uh, though though it was been uh, for uh, uh, for the news for just per kind of kind of a day but that entire uh, incident uh, restoration or we can say uh, the uh, bringing back the business back to normal it took kind of a months of time period but you can you go to the next slide yeah sure but before that uh, so it looks like quite a uh, amazing experience that you have put up over here so 12 am is when you actually got the uh, report that there is a sinking across the server that is happening and you are actually able to scramble the third party uh, within few hours right 3:30 is the time that you have mentioned that uh, you got a code red warning and then you have assembled in a meeting room to discuss about it so basically within 6 hours of time The, you are able to uh, find the script, the root cause, and also you are able to remove the scripts. Of course, the impact of ransomware will take some time to be removed from the system. But this is quite amazing that within uh, that short span of time, uh, because of the the help of third party that were there, you you are able to get it identified and then get it done. Yeah, so let's start with the forensic analysis. Now, this is the uh, the the bigger time stretch. I I am able to see that. Actually, gives the uh, breakup of the uh, 
different activities that you had done over there so over to you again ravi yeah, thanks shiv so yeah this is the second part of the story uh, we can say let, let's let's understand how this exactly happened so again in third party we can say big four was been called to do an entire cyber forensic analysis i would also come to this point why and big four was only been hired to do that uh, forensic analysis uh, at at the end of my slides but yeah uh, it was uh, been realized that it was again a phishing mail so as you see across the most of the organizations the common incidents the root cause is it's again uh, uh, social uh, engineering or people are the common link that are been getting affected so it was a phishing mail that got hit to uh, one of the procurement guy uh, it was said to be around uh, 1st of october so if you just imagine the timeline one month before uh, they got an uh, procurement uh, team persons uh, email id that was been compromised and that email id was been used as an entry point so if you move to the next point uh, it was it was as it was an covid time we all know people were not allowed to go to office uh, most of the manufacturing plants were also having restrictions uh, for physical visits and all so at that time what our infrastructure team was doing they they set up in kind of a virtual desktop environment into a cloud environment and because we all know uh, that was the kind of a priority at that time period uh, but that was the we can say the jump pause that has been used by this uh, uh, threat actors so now they have the credentials of the we can say procurement guys they they did and recon of what exactly uh, devices or we can say uh, cloud uh, kind of a things that are been available into this organization as a route of entry and that vda infrastructure was been used uh, to get an entry so now the threat actors uh, if you see the timeline the threat actors are there into our organization through this vdi and they started this moving this uh, lateral movement across the organization so they started to understand how the center network is all been set across they started to understand the key servers that are been put in place what kind of an compassing controls that we have and uh, something that we also called as living of the land so using the existing techniques within this uh, was the, was one of the uh, we can the feature that was been used by the threat actors also to remain under the radar so if you see uh, i also highlighted though none of these alerts uh, for this entire month uh, was been highlighted to the soc team also so if you move to the third timeline uh, now uh, they started doing this lateral movements uh, they got uh, access into the vdi server and now uh, what uh, as i as i talked about uh, living of the land they used the powershell scripts that are usually been allowed into a server environment so that was the kind of a tools that they use not not an external tool something powershell scripts uh, executing ps executes and then doing a lateral movement taking an ad dump and then identify the key administrator users so if you see the next timeline uh, 6 to 12th uh, entire recon was been done they understood the uh, key servers that were been there within our organization staying under the radar uh, they also found out the online backup servers so in, in case of this ransomware incidents we all know we all depend upon a backup uh, kind of an thing uh, to uh, restore back our uh, we can say operations back to normal so they identified yes there was an online backup server so that that was been taken into picture or we can say that was the one that was been first corrupted when they played that final stroke so online backup servers were been identified during the recon phase uh they also tested a few scripts so if you see uh, the second timeline around 5th 13 to 17 that i have highlighted they tested a few scripts where that was been tested on the secondary ad servers so people who are aware of ad servers that is the kind of an architecture it has been deployed uh, we have primary and uh, we can say the secondary servers so they did not deploy that script or they do not tested that scripts on the primary ad server they just tested it on the secondary server and if you see going back to uh, yeah. around the the next timeline 18 to 24th they they identified that we were having shared folders as as every organization has common sharepoint folders and uh, the common folders that are been shared across various different departments so that was been used to uh, put that script and uh, if you talk about the ad uh, i believe uh, she also talked about the ad infrastructure that was the one hitting around so just to give an example how this ad was been structured we were having a parent ad and all those manufacturing uh, plants were having those child ads that were getting synced so 2 am that you saw into that earlier slide that was the actual time period when that uh, primary ad was getting synced to rest of the child ads and that's that was the time period when that final stroke was been ploed, uh, played and that started syncing across all those plant location and then slowly uh, most of the location ad servers getting impacted and then, then the servers and the rest of the devices so going to the last one uh, as i said uh, uh, they played the final stroke on on the 30th of october uh, they know uh, they have tested the scripts uh, they have placed it into the common folder 
and on 38th of october uh, it was been said uh, not not on the 30th on the 29th in the midnight uh, indian standard time around 9 to 12 uh, that was the final time uh, it was been said that the final stroke was been played but yeah uh, the ad server started syncing around 12 am that was the time that was been set up for the cd servers to sync across those uh, plant servers uh, that was the final time that it started syncing across this plant servers so this is kind of a short analysis of what exactly happened maybe manji we can move to the next slide yeah sure so uh, just uh, one question here uh, uh, ravi but you have mentioned the different timelines so would you also like to highlight the uh, the fact that when you are syncing your parent ad with the child ad uh, is it is it a good practice that you use the same ad for your ot and uh, it environment or this is also one of the lessons learned into your incident yes testing? yes yes i believe that also i, I see a question into this common chat window also uh, most of the organizations if you talk four to five years back the concept of having a separate ad within a uh, ot environment that was not very common but if you see due to this uh, entire threat landscape that has changed now from last three or four years yes that's a very that very much need of having a separate uh, ad uh, into the we can say the ot environment also but into our case it was not the case uh, we were just depending on the central ad and then kind of a child servers have been placed across all those plant locations yeah, thanks. Uh, one more thing, uh, Ravindra. Uh, I mean, uh, not related to forensic analysis, but uh, the impact, you know, uh, when we talk about manufacturing. So what was the magnitude of the impact? Uh, I mean, is it a operational stoppage or uh, some kind of financial uh, losses? Uh, some, because when we do the risk assessment for any plant, so maybe this kind of uh, data would be uh, helpful uh, in, you know, in real world. So just curious to know what was the yeah so as i said 15 plus manufacturing plants so just imagine a company uh, having a uh, pharma company having those kind of an plants where all those medicines are being produced if there is a kind of a downtime what is the kind of an impact financial impact that those organizations would have in the back end I, i'm not here to highlight those kind of an numbers maybe management people would be knowing more better on that but yes it was it was into millions i can clearly say that but if you talk about impact on the ot side yes the, most of the windows servers as i told we all know legacy windows servers are still very common within manufacturing plants uh, specifically the mes servers uh, and the historians i will talk about uh, because being into ot uh, these are the ones that are been primarily the ones that got encrypted and that was the kind of an impact on the ot side also i can say yeah thanks for highlighting that now let's move to the next slide then okay so now we will discuss what was the uh, uh, how did you identify what was the mitigation measure and now uh, we have also discussed the forensic analysis now let's get into the gaps that you identified in your analysis what was the security issues that you have identified with this investigation and i would also like you to take if you could recall uh, some of the tools or techniques that have been used for the forensic analysis that would also be wonderful Yep, yep. Would be happy to take that. So yeah, as highlighted here, so let's start with the first point, social engineering. We all know we can say, uh, though we put a number of technical controls, uh, we, we always have this uh, people being the weakest link within any organization. So security by culture, as I say, or awareness uh, plays a very important role. And it, it's not only across those IT folks, it's, it's across the employees within those organizations. So that was the one uh, we can say social engineering that has been used by the threat actors also. In our case, it was the procurement team uh, getting uh, those uh, uh, we can say credentials compromised and that been used as an entry point into our organization. If you move to the second one, it's VDI infrastructure. So we we all we all know within uh, organizations also there are various different teams that works across. But within our environment, though the infrastructure team uh, has that priority to deploy that VDI infrastructure. Security team was been never involved during that particular evaluation of that particular VDI solution. So that was the existing gap that has been highlighted because that VDI server also did not have few of the controls that should should have been there in place. So when I talk about controls, the next one AV solution. Uh, we we all talk about AV solutions. So it it was been there across the other servers, but that particular AV solution was been missing on the VDI server. Uh, that was that was the kind of a first case. Uh, the other other thing was that. Uh, though proxy solutions are also been there, uh, uh, which has been also used in this case, VDI, to exfiltrate that data out of the organization, uh, I can clearly say. But yes, uh, proxy solutions, uh, though the organization was using a proxy solution, 
uh, there was few gaps onto this uh, VDI solution that has been deployed. Going to the next solutions, backup solutions. So we all know uh, most of the organizations depend on online backups uh, for doing those kind of uh, restoration activities. Also part of this uh, business, uh, uh, we can say impact analysis or uh, BCP as part of this BCP also, we calculate these values based on the, we can say online backup servers that have been there. So in our case, though we had an online backup server, which we had a primary dependency, this, this backup servers are entirely corrupted. So now, now uh, when we talk about it took an entire month for that restoration activity, just imagine if you want to move back to your offline backups, because that is not the case for all the critical servers. Every organization has a different approach to go for an offline backup server. Uh, only few of the critical servers are having an offline backups and then then again to do those kind of an uh, uh, restoring that data from those offline servers it is it is not that easy going to mfa uh, though i can say mfa was been there for the it uh, it fox at least uh, but i i just highlight a gap here uh, into that timeline also i believe uh, uh, we did not mention but uh, there was an alert that has been generated for one of our uh, uh, we can say uh, IT administrator guy who was on vacation. So as I say, people being the VK sling, uh, that guy being on vacation, he did not feel that he should he should inform that because he was raising a, a lot of number of OTPs on his mobile, but he did not inform back to the central SOC team. So that was also the reason when I talk about uh, though this it, this was under the radar that there were a few alerts, but yeah, we can say we can say as a human uh, tendency or an human uh, way of behavior, uh, maybe due to the social engineering, that guy did not feel that he should inform this activity back to the SOC team to do an investigation. So MFA been there, but still uh, not across all the employees, I can say. Uh, but yeah, uh, still across the IT people, but still uh, being a common person uh, on vacation, he did not uh, inform back to those uh, SOC people. Going back to legacy operating system, I believe this is one of the common concern across OT or most of the manufacturing companies. We still have uh, Windows 7, Windows XP systems running into our organizations. We know defense in depth is kind of a common control that we need to put in place. But yeah, still there are gaps into this. Uh, and one of the global location that I talked about, they were uh, the normal machines were also been running on Windows 7 during that time period. So that was the first system that got impacted. And if you talk about the OT side, uh, Windows systems, uh, specifically the XP uh, and Windows 7 were the ones that got impacted during this incident. Going to the next one, SOC operations. Uh, as I said, uh, just to give you a rough figure, as I've been managing the SOC operations also into that organization, we were having 100 plus network devices. So people who are there within this call who can understand 100 plus network devices sending those logs to an SIM solution. And I, I can clearly say, it was one of the top SIM solution, HP Arc side. I, I do not have any concerns naming that solution. But yeah, that was the solution that, that we had in place. But if you talk about the thresholds that are being put in place, that plays a vital role. Because every SOC, op SOC operation person and SOC analyst would, would be knowing that. Unless a particular alert reaches a threshold, there is nothing that is gets highlighted to an L1 analyst. analyst. So that was the case in our case also. Uh, though the threat actors used the living of the land techniques, there was nothing that has been highlighted to the SOC team, 100 plus network devices, sending those logs to the central SIM solution, uh, 24 by 7 team managing that, but none of the alerts that has been highlighted, that was the gap from the SOC perspective. Uh, going to the last one, incident response plan, I believe uh, this, this is one of the thing that is now in very, very much kind of an uh, eager across the organizations now. Uh, though we have a lot of incident response plan, I believe one of the thing uh, that, that we fail is that we do not practice and practice those. Because when an actual incident like an ransomware happens to any organization, every organization fumbles. Uh, there, there's a lot of management pressure. There's a lot of uh, internal pressures that's happened that uh, make my applications first, the restoration uh, plants uh, across location, that's a fumble that happens. So though we have an incident response plans in place, I believe one of the common things that organizations need to understand is that you need to practice and practice those. And until you practice that, uh, practice those incident response plan, then only you are going to identify those gaps. Uh, one of the uh, short gap I just want to hi highlight into this incident response was also that uh, we, we uh, nominate people kind of in primary spokes, right? When we uh, make this incident response plan. But what about if that primary spoke is been not available? And that was also the case, uh, we, we can say, though it was a bad case, I can say, but yeah, that can happen, right? We, we cannot neglect that. The primary spoke, if it's, if it's not present, the other person in that particular manufacturing plant would not be aware what exactly activity from an incident response plant needs to be taken care. 
So that were a few of the gaps. Uh, I, I believe that were been highlighted, and I have just put it across into this current one also. No, no, this is a very good overview, Ravi, and um, I would definitely take some good cues out of it. But I have a couple of questions here, like you highlighted the uh, backup solution. So now uh, there is a discussion that backup should be online or offline. You have clearly identified that online backup is not a good choice at all. But at what extent uh, the backup can be divided in offline versus online in the current environment? Specifically, you see the examples like pharmaceuticals or food and beverages. These are the organization they have plants that would be spread across different geographies and typically their networks are converged. They, they get this... Uh, uh, production data from centralized one location. So they might have this uh, already established uh, network of active uh, directory and maybe most probably these uh, MES systems. So what kind of backup is good for an OT organization, whether they keep it in uh, entirely offline or is there a split possible between online and offline? Uh, so, yeah, good question, Shiv. So, mostly highlighting that it, it depends upon the business criticality. What exactly business criticality data are been there on the servers? So, when I talk about uh, not all not all organizations would go kind of an offline backups also for all those servers. Yeah, it depends upon which of those applications or which of those servers are very critical and if they want to go for an offline backups for those particular servers also. But I have also read across now uh, the online backup servers uh, or, or the solutions that have been available in the market. They also understand this is the risk that has been available and they are also coming up with these new solutions. But specifically talking about OT, I can clearly say that, yes, uh, organizations doing the business impact analysis or BCP activities, they need to clearly identify uh, these situations. Like if an online uh, backup service goes down, what are the kind of a secondary options that they have to make that data resolution back and big business back to normal? So let's take it as an example industry wide, like just with the perspective of pharmaceutical industry. What is the best solution here if I have to take a key takeaway from this one? Whether it's online or offline as a pharma sector? Uh, I, I would I would guess it will be uh, offline also uh, because there are again critical processes. Uh, mm -hmm. Though if you're, if you're cutting down the online process also, uh, you need to depend on those uh, offline backups that can be restored into those times. But yeah, as I said, maybe again, it's an organization decision because it's it's uh, cost is the matter that comes uh, if you talk about online and offline backups yeah. and everything. Uh, if, if, you, if you go to an organization saying that, yes, uh, we need to have this 10 number of servers uh, getting offline backups also. We need to have a proper justification uh, to provide them that why we need an offline backup for all those servers. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I would like to comment on one of the things that you just now mentioned about the identification of key responsible person. I think in next slide also you highlighted this about who would be the key person and who would be the backup person. So I was recently studying one of the uh, tire companies incident and the CEO's interview was there. And when the media asked, what is your key takeaway and why did you, how did you win? So he his takeaway was that we had a clear cut plan on who would take what responsibility so once uh, somebody is given the role of okay this is your decision area and your decision is final that is the need of incident response at the time of incident if you are running uh, like a mad chicken that would not be the ideal situation you will delay your incident response and the mitigation measures so it is very important that you have identified key roles and their decision levels and also their proxies when uh, they are not available Okay, thanks, so thanks you for highlighting uh, that. Uh, just just a point onto that earlier slide. Sure. Uh, we talked about uh, the AD. Uh, we can say the entire dump was been taken out, and as you rightly said, uh, a chicken without head. That was the kind of a situation in our case also. One of the solution that this uh, particular uh, organization that was doing the cyber forensic analysis they suggested uh, now the AD has been uh, out. Uh, we understand the critical accounts passwords have been compromised. Change the passwords for all the users. So if you, if you talk about existing gaps, I, I would I would really like to highlight that here. Uh, it's it's not that easy, right? Changing a password on an employee side, that may be an, an easy job. But what about the service accounts? No, nobody thought about that. And that was the kind of yes. a major drawback when we started changing mm -hmm. those passwords. There are a lot of dependencies we understand. It's not that easy. So as you rightly said, maybe the point of contacts who have been hired, 
uh, they also needs to be technically aware what exactly are the pros and cons when they need to take that firm decisions or maybe the lower level people guiding them that this is the kind of and pros and cons that have been available and you are the one that uh, who, who is the one who is going to take this particular decision now this is very very important point that you have brought about the service account or in 62443 they have been written as software accounts yes, yes. and this is typically one of the discussion that i get when i go for the assessments is what are these accounts typically neither the ot nor the it people are aware about these accounts only the system yes. integrator or system engineer coming from the oem they would know that they have created these different accounts so it's very important that you know them you document them into your user matrix and you also follow your uh, user access review mechanism the same way you are doing for your human accounts yeah i agree I agree sir yeah. so let's move forward to uh, the lessons learned part uh, what yeah. is the key highlights that you would like to bring here yeah so i will not like to go through all this but yeah few of the key highlights that i really think maybe the people here joining here would like to take away cyber insurance we we all know that uh, as part of risk management risk transfer is one of the thing that we transfer our risk to an cyber insurance kind of an organization but uh, i i i been going through that particular incident i can clearly say that i was also the person coordinating for that cyber insurance activities i can clearly say that it was one and a half year that it took time for that cyber insurance company to come back uh, with the amount that was been uh, that we claim and it was not the entire full amount we also have examples from the past i believe uh, one of the ransomware incident for the uh, nox hydro if i'm not wrong it is not the entire full amount that has been paid to those organizations so it's 70 to 80% that that's the claim that you get and there's a lot of documentation that gets involved if you talk about the cyber insurance companies because ransomware if you talk about this uh, for the cyber insurance companies also this is also something new and some organizations would rightly say that it is not under that particular conditions apply kind of in star mark uh, so i will really people here uh, if if you are indians that are hearing uh, we also have a medical insurance kind of a thing right where we have a star mark saying that these are the things that are kind of been exempted so cyber insurance also comes with its own pros and cons so yeah. that is one of the key uh, lessons learned that i will i would like to highlight here that maybe one and half year after that incident that that was the actual uh, claimed amount which was again 70 to 80% that came back and one of the concerns that i clearly see is that there is a lot of documentation that gets involved a lot of invoices lot of bills that you need to submit to those particular organizations when you are when you are planning to take those cyber insurance claim backs you are adding see anything absolutely i would like to add here this is very very important point it's like same uh, disclaimer that people put for the mutual fund they are subject matter of the market <laughs> risk so yes. these, uh, the insurance are the subject matter of those asterisks or the star marks so they are as good as these conditions are and there could be n number of gray areas like one of the key element is the due diligence and if you are not updating your windows systems which are out of life this could become one of the blocker for insurance claim right it's not that easy in ot systems that you claim the same level of uh, insurance that other so we need to be very very careful reading your conditions and then negotiating it properly so thanks for bringing this point ravi yep uh, the other thing uh, i believe i have just like to highlight here is the business continuity uh, as as i talked about bcp bi activities most of the organization do this but uh, when i talked about um, are you really calculating those values considering this kind of an scenarios also because if you if you, if i want to talk about my case when when the bcp was been calculated based on the online backups and when the actual online backups were been not available then the restoration time that was been calculated based on the rtos and the rpos that really literally got changed so that that was the kind of a second lessons learned for us or maybe for the people here that you need to consider this kind of a situations if 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 you, if your online backups are getting corrupted and if you need to restore back from your uh, vacant offline backups it is not that easy job and the other things uh, that that was been faced was that uh, every restoration uh, testing is not that frequently done for offline backups also so if you start restoring those offline backups also there are in many cases you will find that the data has been corrupted into those offline backups also so i believe backup ups uh, and restoration plays a vital role uh, in terms of business continuity but literally you need to consider these scenarios when you to calculate those uh, we can say the rtos and the rpos uh, while doing this business uh, impact analysis i can say 
Yeah, absolutely right point. Uh, it's uh, RPO, RTOs is very important to calculate, but it also depends on being the right people and right stakeholder of level when you are discussing this. I can actually yeah. uh, give an example of one of the assessment that I was doing. And then I asked, what would be the impact if your plant is down for one hour? The answer was $500. And then I asked the same question from the corporate side of the world, and the answer was $30,000. So you can see the disparity in understanding <laughs> the person for working I... in They would just simply calculate, okay, what will happen? We will not produce, but then we will work overnight and then produce. So it is like $500. But then the, the <laughs> picture is different uh, at the corporate side. You need yes, to I agree. Right I agree. to to discuss your RPO, RTOs. Yeah. Yep. Over to you again, Ravi. Yeah, we can move to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to highlight these two key pointers that were kind of lessons learned for me. Okay, so we are possibly yeah, in yeah. the last slide now. What yeah. is your uh, key takeaway from this incident learning? Yeah. yeah, so from this entire short story that I talked about, there are three key takeaways that are highlighted into ABC kind of thing. Awareness, uh, as I told, awareness plays an important role within your organization. Though you have a number of technical controls, uh, your employees on the ground are the ones that needs to be aware. What are the th kind of things we, we all do kind of in fishing simulations, right? But still, uh, we can say, I, I can I can likely say that there are many people who still fall to those fishing kind of an attempts. So awareness uh, and again, and cultural change within the organization should happen. It, it, is, it is not only the IT people should be made aware that what exactly uh, all these phishing and the other attacks have been there. But on the OT side also, people need to be aware what exactly is happening on this side of the world so that they are also aware that they should be not be clicking on those links or they should not be sharing those kind of credentials with the outsiders. Second important learning for me is budget. So I believe many people here would be talking about uh, budget. What, what is the kind of a budget? I can clearly say one thing here is that uh, our organization had an X kind of a budget before the incident. And after the incident, I can literally say it was triple X. So that's the kind of a budget change. But yeah, when we talk about management, uh, they are the ones who take these decisions. But yes, uh, we, the people on the ground, the technical people on the ground, also needs to talk to them into their own layman terms for them to understand what will be the kind of an impact if such kind of an incident happens. I believe you, every organization uh, do this kind of an uh, yearly reviews of what will be the kind of a budget for the next year and they, they plan their various activities. I believe that is the crucial time when we need to clearly see these are the kind of an key concerns that we see within our organization that should be prioritized and then the budget should be allocated to those activities that, that can really play or we can say really help you to have those defense in depth controls put in place. But yes, management people taking those decisions, uh, they are not the ones understanding these uh, things on the ground, but yes, uh, maybe technical people who understand these concerns uh, while while discussing these budget activities with them, you, you need to clearly highlight those kind of fundraise so that you have a proper budget allocated and you have those proper defense in depth controls put in place. Last thing uh, I, I would like to talk about is collaboration, right? Uh, when we talk about any such incidents happening uh, uh, and within manufacturing teams where we have IT and OT kind of an different kind of an cultural people coming together on a common table, uh, I believe col collaboration plays a vital role because that's the crucial time when we need to work together as a team. That is what very, very important across most of the organization. We need to bring those people. And that's why I said into my earlier, uh, we can say conversation also that practice, practice, bringing those common kind of people into a common talks, making them understand how this collaboration can work. Because I understand maybe an IT person may be not understanding all those OT processors on the ground when an entire restoration activity is happening onto a manufacturing plant. Or and maybe a manufacturing plant may be not aware what kind of an concerns would be there from an IT side, the integration concerns and the other uh, security concerns that we have when, when we are trying to restore all those activities. So collaboration, as I said, it, it plays a vital role. and that 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 is the reason a b and c that is the reason i wanted to highlight that as a kind of a takeaways for me that i took from this answer in incident that happened and that that is the kind of a learning that i take into my new organization that i'm working yeah so this is a great uh, takeaway a b and c of course awareness is the very important part it's is important not only for the people who are working there it's uh, very important for everyone it is important for us as well we also get to see different kind of phishing emails every day so, and if you are not aware and not vigilant then anybody can fall prey social engineering is a very tough game actually budgets you see lots of memes online that in security when there is no incident there is zero budget and when there is incident then there is a uh, 
track load of budget is available. Collaboration, of course, is the key, and that is the reason you see on the other safety incidents also there are mock drills, there are fire drills, so these are happening, and that's the exactly the same point that during the time of incident, how people will collaborate, what are the procedures, how uh, fast you can scramble your uh, tools and techniques and all those things. So definitely, this is a game of uh, people coming together, working together towards a common goal to uh, defy the unknown. Yeah, so thanks, Ravi. Thanks for uh, summing this up uh, for me. This is a good learning, good experience. And uh, maybe I'll quickly have a look uh, once uh, again. Shri, just, just to add in, uh, just a last point, uh, collaboration. Uh, I also think when, you, when now OT people talk about the various different projects that have been uh, taken away into the OT, uh, mm-hmm. when these IT people come along, collaboration literally plays a vital role. Uh, OT and IT people really need to work together for all these projects to uh, to be properly driven across those organizations to have those controls put in place. So I literally feel that yes, collaboration across organization with that security mindset li- will literally help every organization to defend against this kind of an attacks in the future. Oh yeah, absolutely right. Okay, so we don't have much of the question. I think we had already tried to answer this. So Itran is asking, can you throw some light on cloud-based backup solution for OT? Would you like to add something, Ravi? Uh, I've just heard about uh, Vim Backup uh, now being uh, giving solutions to OT also. But yes, uh, uh, from uh, from an uh, uh, we can say vendor perspective, uh, I've also heard of, of there are there are many other solutions that have been available in the market, uh, specifically to OT, specifically to the various vendors that we have uh, that provides this kind of solutions. Yeah. So uh, what I would take it is like any solutions which is. Uh, either offline or online or in cloud you need to do your due risk assessment what are you achieving with that backup what kind of backup you want to do in the cloud you can have some backups or maybe a network restoration but there may be different kind of backup requirement specifically in the case of OT or plc programs which could be very very critical there could be your recipes which is very critical so what you are going to put in the cloud be very vigilant do a due risk assessment from the professionals and then you get to identify what is the requirement for that particular organization then uh, i think we don't have much of the questions the one question about having a separate uh, ad we have already uh, discussed there is one question uh, i think this was during the discussion that you are putting uh, the lateral movement of their ransomware. So I think it is heading out there. Do they don't have any DMG for the plants? So would you like to answer this uh, about the incident? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there was, there was no separate DMG, I can literally say. Uh, and uh, now uh, ISC been also been referring this reference architecture where we need to have this uh, le- uh, level 3.5 within the OT environments also. So that is the kind of a learning for most of the organizations. I can say from the last three or four years, they have started building up this kind of an activities. But yes, uh, uh, that has not been placed into my earlier organization. But yes, that was a kind of a lessons learned. I will just like to add one more thing. I believe uh, that I did not cover into my EV solutions part uh, uh, that I talked about. Though we were having uh, one of the, uh, we can say, uh, specific EV solutions for both IT and OT. Uh, let me just highlight a few of the concerns I believe might be kind of a takeaway for the people. Uh, again, these AV solutions are also being tweeted. Uh, when I say tweeted, not all those security engines or uh, functions are being enabled. Maybe due to this, uh, if you talk about OT specific uh, servers and all, uh, availability being the prime concerns. Sometimes they, they feel that when an AV so- solution has been deployed onto an OT, uh, we can say asset or a window based asset, if it has been supporting, it might have a performance issues. So that was also one of the concerns that this AV solutions that we were having into our organization that was been kind of and been uh, not been fully utilized. Few of the key, key functions like IPS and other things have been disabled. Uh, also, one of the uh, key function uh, where uh, to disable an AV and password will be required uh, for the server specifically. So that was the kind of a function that has been available. But yeah, that was not been literally used on the ground. That may be a number of reasons for that, but I, would, I do not want to go into that. But I also feel that though you have a number of solutions, how effective are those solutions on the ground? That kind of an reviews needs to be done on a kind of an periodic basis or kind of an at least an yearly basis. Because though just placing those solutions would not help you guys, uh, it's how fine tune you do th- to those solutions. As I talk about the SOC solutions uh, and this AV solutions, access review or we can say re- fine tuning of those solutions will literally help you 
uh, in a longer run i can say instead of just adding one more solution to the bucket just uh, make sure that existing solutions are been fine tuned they are been utilized at at the kind of a highest that can be used and that can li- literally help you to defend against this kind of an attacks yeah configurations issues are a big big chunk of the overall security issues yeah so thanks for bringing that point ravi yeah, it was definitely a good learning experience for me and i hope the same for the people who are joining online and uh, uh, all all of our recordings are actually available to be viewed later on youtube or linkedin so people uh, if you really like this work that we have been doing do tag us and let us know what do you feel about this session in the comments uh we will definitely read out and answer those comments if you feel that we need to take a specific topic for our next sessions please do let us know with that uh thanks ravi thanks for joining and uh, have a good rest of good evening for all the people joining online thank you thanks you thanks all bye guys